up next, a duo from Lincoln, Nebraska, spellbound listeners everywhere with a prophecy that there will come a time when machines will completely take over. Humans won't need teeth, legs, or eyes. That's if a man can even survive. The story of a truly strange song that foretold the future of mankind more than 500 years from now, uh, that this band recorded in the middle of a cow pasture, and then they sold it out of the trunk of their cars, and it went to number one for six weeks and sold five million copies. And then as if aliens abducted them, the band just vanished into thin air, never heard from again. The truly strange story is next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember when a payphone used to cost a dime, you're gonna love this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. We also have a Patreon, you can check that out. Uh, both keep it a daily channel. All right, it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning, where we celebrate a song or an album that was king for a day or for many days. Here we honor artists and bands that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons unknown, we're able to sustain that success long-term. Called by some as one hit wonders, we celebrate them instead as lightning in a bottle. And this is definitely the most requested Bottle Lightning song we've ever had on here. So I got two words for you, exordium, and terminus, a Latin phrase that means beginning and end. It was attached as the mysterious parenthetical tag for one of the most fascinating bolts of bottle lightning baked into a disc of vinyl in the year 2525 by Zager and Evans. The year 2525. Written by Rick Evans, the ballad drew inspiration from Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, painting a vivid picture of a future ensnared by humanity's reliance on technology. Sound familiar? This dystopian narrative echoed themes of the Russian-born American Ayn Rand's philosophy, portraying a bleak world where individuals' autonomy were stripped away. In the grim reality of Rick's song, behavior, words, even thoughts will be programmed into a daily pill, eliminating the very essence of free will and individual identity. You, and say is in the pill you, took today. you know, it's kind of surprising. Uh, Zager and Evans cooked up one of the most interesting singles of 1969, but they were never really a big deal after that. Instead, they pulled off one of the greatest vanishing acts in the history of rock and roll. They soared to the top of the charts with a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100 that held strong for six weeks straight. But then after that, they just sort of faded into obscurity and never returned to the Hot 100 ever again. They may fall. So what happened? Let's get into it. Denny Zager and Rick Evans came from the land of the Cornhuskers, Lincoln, Nebraska. The two met at university in 1961. Denny was searching for a guitarist for a group he wanted to assemble named the Eccentrics. Uh, his vision for the band was something like a Simon and Garfunkel vibe. He saw Rick performing at a talent show at the university and he invited him to be part of his new group. After Rick signed on, Danny Schindler came on board to be the drummer and the Eccentrics forged ahead as a trio instead of a duo. The Eccentrics earned a reputation as one of Nebraska's earliest standout rock bands. Their mesmerizing vocal harmonies and distinctive hairstyles set them apart from other local bands for sure. It gave them a unique and memorable presence on stage. In 1964, Rick wrote in the year 2525, a truly thought-provoking song delving into the theme of technology's dominance over humanity. Despite his enthusiasm for the song, though, Rick faced resistance from his bandmates in the Eccentrics when he proposed recording the song uh, in the year 2525, Exordium and uh, Terminus. Uh, the band members, they were really hesitant to tackle what they saw as a dark and really unconventional topic. Or tear it down and start again. Oh, oh. I mean, just imagine pouring over uh, his lyrics, his words on paper, grappling with their meaning and envisioning how they could be transformed into a concise three or four minute pop song back in that day. Once upon a distant future, the year 2525 unfolds as a distant vista, a time where mankind, if it endures, uh, would witness the transformation of truly shocking events. In the year 2525 began its journey there. Its verses leaping through the corridors of time, 
in uh, thousand year intervals, you know, 25, 25 to 35, 35, and then 45, 45. With each shift, the narrative paints a portrait of humanity's evolution, or perhaps de-evolution. In the year 35, 35, human life will morph into a society of automation and idle existence. Minds engulfed by pills ingested to control thoughts while machines take over the functions of eyes, teeth, and limbs, rendering them obsolete. As the centuries roll on to 45, 45 and beyond, the march of technology continues its relentless advance. Human life becomes a mere cog in the machinery of progress, with marriage fading into obsolescence. And children are conceived in sterile test tubes rather than through the union of two people. With each verse, in the year 2525 predicts humanity's trajectory. And as the song concludes in the distant echoes of 9595, it's hard not to think about the inevitable fate of mankind in the eons to come. It's optimistic to think that we wouldn't make it that far for sure. A science fiction novel? Definitely. But a pop song? I mean, I kind of understand why a band member would think, is Rick Evans some kind of modern day Nostradamus or is he just a little bit crazy? In the year 95, 95, I'm gonna What's even wilder is that Rick Evans claims that he, uh, he wrote that thought provoking song in like 15 minutes while riding in the back of a Volkswagen minivan heavily baked from just smoking weed. That kind of makes sense. 25, 25. When the eccentrics rejected in the year 2525 in 1964, uh, Rick, he just brushed the song aside, waiting for his futuristic song to be created into a prophecy for the world. Soon after, Danny quit the band he conceived and he built another group called the DeVilles. Uh, Rick trudged along with Danny Schindler a little while, but Danny had the bell when he was drafted and then sent to Vietnam and the eccentrics became insignificant from there. Three years later in 1968, Danny and Rick decided to get back together as a duo, uh, which is kind of what it was gonna be in the first place, aptly billing themselves Zager and Evans. This time around, they were hungry for breakout success, but they needed stronger material to record on an album. The search was daunting, so they went back to some older songs they'd written. They never really got a shot. Rick went back to his composition that freaked everybody out, including Denny Zager. When Rick resubmitted it to his partner, Denny was still uh, reluctant to commit. He wasn't crazy about the song to begin with, and it wasn't the style that he wanted to do it to sound like. On the flip side, after sitting on it for four years, Rick was more determined than ever to craft his song into something really special. Before they recorded in the year 2525, Zager and Evans put it into their live set to see how the audience was gonna react to it. Every time they played the song, the crowd listened with stunned looks on their faces, seemingly in a hypnotic trance. When the song ended, they got a resounding ovation. Rick's omen of the systematic destruction of humanity got the biggest response of the night every time. Lies, everything you think, do, and say. Eventually, they were flooded with requests to get a copy of the song from fans who heard them perform the song in the clubs around Lincoln. So Danny sketched a new arrangement for in the year 2525 that would be more fitting for the duo to sing. And they had it all ready to record. The only problem was they didn't have any money for the studio time. That was a real thing back then. But they were able to beg, borrow, and scrape to get $500 to cut that track. They also recruited some local players to back them up in the recording sessions. Mark Dalton was brought in to play bass and Dave Trupp he took over drums. And the year 2525 was recorded in a small recording studio in the middle of a cow pasture in Odessa, Texas. It was done in one single take. Hey, it wasn't Muscle Shoals or Electric Lady, but it was sufficient enough to record the track and press it on the DIY label Truth Records and then distributed to local radio stations. Uh, the track was produced by Tommy Alsop, though, who owned that small recording studio. You might remember that uh, a legend of Odessa, Texas, Tommy had played guitar with Buddy Holly, and 
He was the, the lucky one who lost that coin toss to Richie Valens in the historic plane crash that killed Richie along with Buddy Holly and the Big Bopper. Yeah. Danny Zager recalled that when Rick and the guys arrived at the studio to work with Tommy, he said, all right, let's cut that weird song. In the year 35, 35, ain't gonna need Tommy invited musicians from West Texas to play the string section uh, that he wrote up for Zager and Evans, including some students from Permian High School. They were credited as the Odessa Symphony on the record. When Zager and Evans and their band returned to Nebraska, they had 5,000 copies made of the single. Believe it or not, they sold most of the initial batch of the 45s from out of the trunk of their car. <laughs> the trunk of their car, man, I miss those days. Now, as we continue to break down this classic song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. You know what, Zenny is celebrating their 21st birthday and they're having a really big sell. You buy one pair of glasses and you get 25% off each additional pair of glasses over $10. Uh, just put in our exclusive coupon code, birthday24POR. Uh, click on the link right up here to do that. And it's also down here. And remember, it's only for a limited time, so hurry. So back to the story, like a biblical prophet in the year 2525 may have warned of the impending danger of technology, but the dissemination of that revolutionary message didn't originate from innovation or from the top of a majestic mountain. Instead, it originated from a cow pasture and a car trunk. <laughs> Echoing the audience enthusiasm when Zager and Evans performed in the year 2525 in their live shows, radio listeners too, they were over the moon about the single. Every radio station in Lincoln and Omaha uh, that played the record reported the same thing. Huge immediate reaction with every single play. The buzz about the trending tune spread quickly around the record business. And pretty soon, Zager and Evans were signed by big wig entertainment mogul Jerry Weintraub. And after he flew to Lincoln to meet with the duo, Jerry became their manager and he got him a record deal at RCA. Uh, Danny and Rick's relationship with Jerry that would prove to be short-lived, but they would later have another bit of history in common with Jerry when in 1970, he managed John Denver before his breakout hit, Take Me Home Country Roads. Covered that one a few months ago. Country roads, take me home. Denny actually disclosed that John used to write letters to him and Rick asking how they knew about test tube babies and other evolutionary happenings. Uh, that were yet to be discovered. No wonder John was impressed with Rick's clairvoyance. He wrote the song in 1964, but the first test tube baby wasn't achieved until 1978. Rick jokingly responded that he had been abducted by aliens who gave him the power to see into the future. Maybe those aliens uh, kidnap these guys. I'll tell you about that in a second. RCA immediately launched a national radio promotion plan for in the year 2525. The single entered the Billboard Hot 100 on June 21st, 1969 at number 72. Three weeks later on July 12th, it reached the pinnacle of the survey and it held at number one for six consecutive weeks, just three weeks later. The track also shot to number one in Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, and the UK. It peaked at number two down under. By the end of 1969, in the year 2525, would end up selling more than four million copies in that year. Danny Zager and Rick Evans earned the worldwide success that they'd always dreamed of. I mean, normally when an act creates such a monster smash, they would parlay that heat into more good fortune. But it just wasn't meant to be. Zager and Evans released five more singles after the astonishing run of In the Year 2525. But surprisingly, none of these singles cracked the Hot 100. Although it got a little traction in Canada, the follow-up uh, Mr. Turnkey, that stiffed at number 106 in the U.S. The other four singles didn't even get that close. Mr. Turnkey, you ain't never seen nothing like this before. Zager and Evans just disappeared after that. They went their separate ways just a year later in 71. At present in 2024, Denny Zager still had Zager Guitars based in Lincoln, Nebraska, specializing in the production of custom guitars. Uh, Mark Dalton is still playing the bass in the Pacific Northwest. Dave Trupp, who fought unsuccessfully for royalties, died in 2015. 
And then after the breakup with his partner, Danny Zager, Rick Evans, the man who started the phenomenon of in the year 2525, pretty much withdrew from the public eye. He actually died of natural causes at his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico in 2018. He was 75 years old. Through the years as I've researched this song, because I've always been fascinated by it, trying to get anything I could on it. There was an internet rumor some years ago that uh, Zager and Evans were abducted by aliens, and that's why they disappeared and why their songs didn't do well after. And of course, that's a bunch of, a bunch of gunk. But uh, it's really upsetting to me that Rick's passing went largely unnoticed. I mean, considering the massive success of In the Year 2525. After all, to date, the song has sold over 5 million copies. Truly one of the most mysterious songs ever. And that's why I'm proud to give the song and Rick Evans and Danny Zager the tribute that they deserve. He's He's taken everything this old earth can give. I was pretty surprised to learn that in the year 2525 has been redone over 60 times and covered in seven different languages. There's even a Jewish parody and an Italian version. <laughs> Here's another interesting fact. After the September 11th attacks, Clear Channel Communications sent out a memo to all their radio stations listing about, I think it was 165 songs that they thought had socially harmful lyrics. And surprisingly, well, perhaps unsurprisingly, in the year 2525 was on that list. It was the year 1969 when Zager and Evans struck a chord with listeners all over the world with their prophetic masterpiece. It was a whirlwind year that was one of the most pivotal in history, culturally and technologically. One might say that the, the palette was ideal for a well-crafted song about the future. 1969 was marked by groundbreaking achievements in science, technology, and the vibrant world of music. While the U.S. launched nine space flights, including the historic Apollo 11 missions that saw humans land on the moon, NASA's Mariner 7 spacecraft captured stunning images of Mars from a close distance. Uh, the first successful in vitro fertilization of a human egg marked a milestone in medical history. Uh, while ARPANET, the precursor to the internet, sent its inaugural computer-to-computer -computer message. Amidst these scientific feats, the music scene was equally dynamic. Iconic concerts like Woodstock, promoting peace and love and the Altamont Free Festival, marred by tragedy, uh, it captured headlines. The Beatles, they bid farewell with their final public performance while John Lennon and Yoko Ono led anti-war protests from their bed in. Musical legends like Led Zeppelin, Johnny Cash, The Who, and Bob Dylan, uh, they all released seminal albums. And newcomers like David Bowie introduced audiences to the ethereal journey of Major Tom and Space Oddity. It was a transformative era for sure. This is ground control to Major Tom. It certainly appeared that Zager and Evans harbored doubts about humanity's ability to change its course for the future. I mean, the song was written and proliferated during one of the lowest points of American history. You know, the Vietnam War and under the ominous cloud of nuclear war, the civil rights movement, all those things that were happening. A bleak outlook was easily understood, if not condoned. However, one particular stanza towards the end of In the Year 2525 challenges this notion, leaving a lingering impression on me for sure. In that moment, the tempo of the record it dramatically slows down and the duo delivers a poignant message. Now it's been 10,000 years man has cried a billion tears for what he never knew. Now man's reign is through. For what he never knew, now man's reign is through. But through eternal night, the twinkling of starlight so very far away, maybe it's only yesterday. Maybe it's only yesterday. Yes, Zager and Evans epitomized the term one hit wonder, bottle lightning, holding the unfortunate title of the most abrupt vanishing act in the annals of the Billboard pop chart. 25, if man is still alive. However, their legacy should transcend mere statistical labels. Instead, they ought to be celebrated for creating one of the, uh, the most thought-provoking, intellectually stimulating, and artistically valiant compositions of the entire rock era. It's true. In the year 35, 35. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Zager and Evans and this bottle lightning class. One of the coolest songs ever, I'm serious. 
What are your memories of this song? What did you think when you first heard it? The lyrics, the composition, everything. Let's talk about it below. Let's have a great tribute to Zager and Evans. Uh, if you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friend.